Thank you, everyone. I would like to share the stories about my research in, um, in the caves. My research actually started off with being wet, cold, and of course, in the dark. Any one of us here actually gone to the caves before? Yes, <laughs> great. So um, back then, in, um, I started this, this um, research and my first trip in North American uh, caves actually started in summer of 2003. Um, here you can see more fall caves and trying to get to the, the cave entrance here, we had to walk be behind the waterfall and then cross the ledge and get to the other side there. So um, I was there with my close, um, close colleagues, Dr. Joanna Urban, and then my first undergraduate research student, Stephanie Richards, who actually had admittedly saying that she hasn't been much of an outdoor, per um, outdoor person until she decided to work with me. She actually decked out with all full caving gears, you know, with head, um, with the helmet, with um, headlamp on. Um, going in is actually was very easy. We were all chatty. Well, actually, back up a little bit. I, I, I needed to say that, you know, I was there excited and I felt confident um, and prepared. Actually, at the time, I thought that I was prepared for this environment. Um, my, even though my limit, uh, limited knowledge of um, black bear, it's actually only coming from the nature show on TV or, you know, and, and the zoo. And I know that in Wells Gray Provincial Park in Canada is home of black bears. <clears throat> I even bought um, a bottle of bear spray to, you know, to take with me there, <laughs> just in case. Anyway, so going in was very easy. We were all chatty and we were excited. We making noise because we know that making noise would keep the bears away. However, coming back out, it was a total different story. We were so tired and we hiked back in silence and sure enough, we saw, I know, just, you know, ahead of me, <laughs> we saw, and this is the worst case scenario when you see bears in the wild, we actually saw a mother bear with her two cups, and her two cups were frank between us on the trail. So, I, you know, this sight actually stopped me in my track, and I was so scared. However, as a prof, I pretended. I pretended not to be scared for, you know, the other's sake and my own sake as well. I, <laughs> when I saw that, I said to Stephanie and jo Joanna, well, you know, the bear's ahead of us. So we started to walk back slowly and by the book, you, what you're supposed to do, not to run, but what you're supposed to do is that you're supposed to walk back slowly and then lower your body down so that you show no, no sign of threat to, to, to the mother bear. And at the same time, I said to Joanna, please get the bottle ready, the, the bear spray bottle that we have with us, get it ready. But little did the three of us know, I'm being a Thai scientist. Like I said, I don't know much about black bears at the time, you know, anyway. So we did not realize that the bottle of the bear spray had only one good use of the spray unlike the hairspray that we use, or any one of us use many days, it's, you know, continuous use. This one with the bear spray is only one good use, one good shot in case the bear come closer to you. So we ended up spray it out without checking the wind direction even. <laughs> you can imagine what happened. We, all three of us, spray ourselves, and you know, we were coughing like mad. And the mother bear actually looked back at us and she probably think pathetic. Anyway, so she actually took the bears, uh, took the cups and walked walk away. So we thought, okay, she walked away. So we waited for what seemed like a long time. And we thought, okay, make sure that she really, really took her cups further away. 
So finally, we decided, okay, that's enough time. Let's just walk back on the trail. So when we walk back, up ahead, right by the trail, she actually sat herself right next to the trunk of the tree, and she actually sent her two cups up the tree. So I absolutely, at the time, it's like, I'm not actually walking past that bear. <laughs> so we decided to bushwhack out to safety. I have to confess that at the time, I entertained the idea of dropping off all the samples that I got from the cave and run for my life. <laughs> but we didn't. Anyway, so that was a cave trip to remember for me, and it earned my reputation by the students that if anyone want to work with Anne, they have to prepare to be a bear bit. <laughs> <laughs> so that was how I start my research journey into finding new antibiotics in bacteria that live in um, caves, or extreme habitats like cave. So we are living in an extremely changing world. And the world, this world is actually very fluid. It's so fluid than ever. The world that has strict uh, physical borders to many species, including us. However, to microorganisms, <coughs> the concept of artificial borders and geopolitical boundaries are of no use. Microorganisms these days travel further and faster than ever before, carrying no passport, no IDs, <coughs> and no any amount of guards and at any certain checkpoint could stop nor control these movements of microorganisms. And some of these traveling microorganisms can cause mayhem. Now we global citizens, we can we have witnessed that um, Microorganisms have adapted to change, and they, they continue to adapt very fast. And we actually now are threatened by what is called as perfect microbial storm. These refer to conditions that, influ uh, that support and promote emergence and re-emergence of infections, especially infectious diseases. We have seen that we now um, travel, uh, travel around the world as you know, our trade networks and line transportation like, actually expanded. So with this fact alone, and on top of this, we are experiencing severe consequences of climate change that impact our economic, um, uh, economic uh, economic output and input, and also this actually um, the the um, climate change has impact habitat destructions, human and animal behaviors, also food uh, food changes and social networks. So once all of these conditions are met, we will see the dire um, impacts and consequences of the perfect storm. Um, perfect microbial storm that we talked about. So basically we will see more infections from once used to be harmless microorganisms. We will also see cross-species infections uh, from microorganisms that found new niches. And we will see antibiotic resist infections from antibiotic resistant um, microorganisms. <clears throat> we are in urgent need of new antibiotics, new and actually I should say new and more effective antibiotics. Because we have antibiotic, um, antibiotic resistance, which is a global, global, global health threat at hand right now. It is estimated that um, since 2017, we will see at least 25,000 deaths caused by antibiotic resistant infections in Europe alone. And by 2050, we will possibly see more than 10 million people die worldwide of, uh, as a result of antibiotic resistant infection. And on top of that, one of um, another problem is that to have one new antibiotics developed 
being developed, proved, um, I mean tested and approved to be used on the shelf in our society, it can take from 10 to 25 years with an estimated cost of approximately $1.7 billion. And this is actually a, a, a huge um, hinder for the industry. On top of that, regulatory barriers have made making or developing new antibiotics less, less attractive to larger pharmaceutical companies. Antibiotic resistance in microorganisms, it was once believed to be caused by mainly human activities, including overuse and misuse of antibiotics in our society. This observation is not entirely true anymore. In 2012, a group of scientists led by Dr. Jerry Wright of McMaster University in Canada supported a growing knowledge that antibiotic resistance is natural, ancient, and innate in microorganisms. And this, their research also actually opened up to people like myself. It actually also says that possibly there are a lot of molecules that bacteria are producing and that we might be able to use that as new antibiotics too. <clears throat> so many people might ask why looking for new drug in caves? <laughs> Why not somewhere else? Why I have to go crawling down, you know, in the subterranean um, habitats like this? Cave represents other less studied ecological habitat that are home to many new and potentially unique bacteria that could be producing molecules that we can use them as new drugs, basically. So these are just assorted um, pictures of different caves that we study um, in our lab. And as you can see that we can even see bacterial mat of different colors of, of microorganism on the cave wall in some of the caves that we study. <clears throat> Many people also might be wondering what can actually live in such darkness? Everywhere we look, believe it or not, we see bacteria everywhere. So as you can see in this slide here, this is an example of cave popcorn sample, the um, secondary mineral deposits, or we call as cave decorations. These cave decorations we found in limestone caves. And as you can see here, we observed bacterial communities in them and different types of bacteria live in there and even this one in cave rock sample so you can see that are uh, those spiky <clears throat> type of broad shape there and you know different biofilm different types of bacteria that live in 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 biofilm there so these are just example so <clears throat> our last excuse me our last um, expedition was done at Iron Curtain Cave, a limestone cave in Chilliwack, which is about two hour drive east of Vancouver. And this one, this, this cave is particularly very interesting because as the name suggested, it has iron leaching out. And we are wondering, we are actually looking into this cave popcorn and cave soda straw there we are looking into what kind of bacteria that live in this inhospitable structure. Because when you really think about it, this structure uh, is not a lot of organic matter that bacteria can use to be food, food. And it's actually has high mineral content there. And some mineral that we found in there that we analyzed, actually we used to, be, to, to think that it's toxic to cell. So how, how can this bacteria actually grow, growing in this habitat? And we are actually, so far, we have isolated and screened more than 2,000 bacteria coming from those two samples from the cave. And <clears throat> we found that um, a good number of them show antimicrobial activity against multidrug resistance when tested in 
in the lab. However, from what we're doing right now to the fact that we can put out or, or whether we can or not, you know, to put out a new drug on the shelf is actually a very um, lengthy uh, process. However, we are zeroing in to cave bacteria right now. We are working with our collaborator at the University of Ottawa, Dr. Christopher Body. We're looking into genome sequencing of these two specific bacteria. And we want to see whether we can mine the genes that are less responsible for this, um, the production of these antimicrobial agents and whether we can make use of these genes um, to, to make us the new drug. <clears throat> Excuse me. My research, one, my research, um, one cave at a time, and with a lot of help with many people, including students, collaborators, caving communities, and um, and funding agency. It's solely a small and starting piece of this uh, in this whole puzzle fight, uh, to fight against anti antimicrobial or antibiotic resistant infections. We actually may need to, you know, when, when, when the perfect microbial storm hit us, whether we can weather it and how, um, I believe that we can. However, we may, need to, may need, we may need to shift and commit and refocus our effort to be more holistic and <clears throat> collaborative. Recently, one health concept started to regain its importance in public and global health. One health concept is actually, um, this concept talks about the fact that human health, animal health, and environmental health are of one and inseparable. And we may need to, to use this, uh, mindfully use this one health concept to help fight such complex and interrelated global health threat that we have at hand. <clears throat> After all, we have only one world and one health. As um, Chris Hadfield, a Canadian astronaut, as seen here with my son, Ryder, stated in the interview he did with Nation National Geographic. And by the way, it's really a good series. Please check it out. It's called um, One Strange Rock. He stated that the beauty of a space flight is when you come back with a real sense that the Earth is one place, one shared place, and we are all crewmates on the same ship. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>